This is a going back, remembering UGA interview, and today, May 7th, 2013, we are talking with Abbott Massey, who has a lifetime of history with the University of Georgia in Athens. We're visiting on campus in the Ray Nicholson House, home of the university's alumni association, a most appropriate site due to Abbott's longtime connection with UGA's alumni groups. Bill Evelyn is our videographer, and I am Fran Lane. Abbott, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, and we're just excited that you're going to share your memories with us, and let's jump in and start from the beginning. My yeah. pleasure, Frank. It's always good to be on the University of Georgia campus and to talk about UGA. Do I understand you were born in Greenville, South Carolina? Does that born in Greenville, South Carolina. My parents were both from Georgia, but were living in Greenville at the time I was born, and later moved back uh, happily to to so Athens. Everybody getting back to Georgia. That's good. That's yeah. right, which was good for six of us to be able to attend the University of Georgia. That's, that's a wonderful record. Abbott, talk, how did you get the name Abbott? It's been a given name in my family for generations, not in a direct line, but it was the name of, uh, of my uncle, Abbott Nix, and it goes on back to to, to an, an abbot at the time of the war between the states. And, All your forebears, right? And we don't, we don't see it anywhere else, but we try to keep it alive. It's a, it's a middle name for my son, Lewis, and the middle name for his older son, Chandler. I think that's wonderful. I, I tried to put that into my uh, Kindle fire the other day, and every time I would write abbot, it would make it a bit. So uh, you, <laughs> you're right. causing... Because you don't see... Right. I'm sorry I caused you that trouble. I was going to say, I'm name anyway. glad to know you're causing technology trouble because it causes us trouble, and I think. Sometimes so it's spelled several other different ways so people understand that it is just A-B-I-T. It was special to have a good name like that, though. You moved to Athens in about 1939, is that I what moved I moved in 1939, and, and uh, Fran, that was a good day that when we came there, my father had a very successful paving business, was a paving contractor in Greenville, South Carolina, and when uh, President Roosevelt's WPA and PWA programs came in with all the good they did in providing jobs and, and uh, paving roads and highways and building parks and other things along with the CCC, it, uh, it uh, basically put a small contractor uh, out of business. And uh, my older brother was at the University of Georgia. In fact, the second one had already started here, and the, and the third one wanted to come. I didn't understand the sacrifice my parents made at the time, but they picked up stakes from what had been a comfortable situation in Greenville and uh, came, came to Athens. My mother was from Jackson Point in Jackson County and daddy in, in uh, Banks County, so just not too far from their original homes. but. They moved uh, here to send six of us through school and opened a restaurant called the Coed, the name that Daddy selected. And, I know that one. And it was where the Episcopal Chapel is now at the crest of Lumpkin Hill across from that gazebo or bus stop or whatever. So they ran that for, for almost 10 years. To and a popular place it was. A popular place for, for townspeople and for students. Absolutely. And, that's interesting to know. Did, were you living on Wilcox Street? Yeah, we lived on Wilcox. What a great was, neighborhood, Abbott. We were at the corner of Wilcox and Bloomfield, and it was a great location. We were in walking distance of the co-ed and in walking distance of the UGA campus. Yes, and, sir. And it was really a good place to live, a good neighborhood. And when you were about 12 then, is that right? I was right? 12 when we... <laughs> what was Athens like to a 12-year-old boy when you when you got here? How Physically and, and just neighborhood-wise? and well, it was uh, just a nice place to to live, good good neighbors around us, and good to have access to the University of Georgia campus, and uh, good schools in Athens. My, my first school was what they then called junior high school. It was on Child Street. Miss Patty Hillsman was the oh. principal. She now has a school name for, for her very, very appropriately, but, and then went to, uh, to, to Athens Out on Prince Avenue. High School. That's, that's right, Child Street, just off of uh, Prince Avenue. That's exactly right. So that was a... I actually went to Child Street with the baby boomers. They didn't have a... They had to 
expand that year and sent some of us to Child Street. Oh, is that right? That's, that's, well, my mom went to Child Street, but it's been around a good while. Good That's a good location. I don't think that building is there. I, I, it's, it's great to hear that, that you, you had that opportunity to. And then, of course, went on to Athens High School, which was then on Prince uh, Avenue. Well, there, where the Cobb home is. Right, the Cobb, the, right. Yeah, the, gym, the gymnasium and is still there. And was that old, isn't the old jail behind the Cobb house? It is, it is. That was a military building for the ROTC uh, program. Was uh, Mr. Mel the principal when you Mr. were Mr. Mel was the principal. In fact, I'll tell you a story if tell, you tell me a story. want me to about that. He was a, a, a fine principal and a tough disciplinarian, but was, was fair and, and popular. And when he reached 65, which was in the spring of my junior year at Athens High School, the school board announced that he would retire on his 65th birthday. And the students were not happy. And the senior class uh, organized a strike and distributed uh, leaflets uh, telling all the students to come on to that area but don't go in the classroom building, go to the, to the gymnasium. And my parents told me that it didn't matter where anybody else would be, that I would be in the classroom. So f for a week, I was the only junior in Athens High School. There were seven or eight seniors there and uh, Miss Ruby Anderson, who was a great English teacher, one of the very first award-winning teachers for the state of Georgia, was an English teacher. So she and I were one-on-one -on -one in the table <laughs> of, uh, long, longer oh, than this. Oh, what an one. experience! So uh, I was pleased when <laughs> it's one of those things that's not supposed to work, but it did. They put Mr. Mel on for the end of the year, and all of the students came back to class. So. When we have a reunion, I'm able to tell my classmates that I have a week's more education than <laughs> <laughs> any of them. Oh, that would have been what, 1940? That would have been uh, 43. 43? Uh -huh. Middle of the war. That's correct. What, what effect did it, ha did it have on your growing up teenage years? How, how did the war affect you? Well, uh, I can remember going with mother, interestingly enough, to the high school gymnasium to sign up for the certificates and the, and the, the stamps right. to be able, be able to purchase ga gas and certain foods and ev everything. And uh, I think they were A and B categories or something, and, and, if, and if you got one for personal and one for the, for the, for the business. And I, I don't remember any any real hardships. I remember that, uh, you know, having scrap drives and bond drives and stuff at school and- War bonds going, going, and-, going, and to, uh, going to pick, going to, to pick cotton a time or two as a school project and things like that. But I had two older brothers who were in the war and saw some very serious action. So, and I realized in later years how tough that must depend on my parents, but you know that was a little of a strain to know that uh, that that uh, they were they were doing their duty and they bo they bo they didn't delay. They both rushed to service, but you know that was one of the things I remember is, uh, is, is wondering how they were doing and and waiting for the letters to arrive. All right, different different time. Athens High School and and. Uh, I graduated from Athens High School, so it's it's interesting to hear you talk about folks that I've heard about or known. Miss Ruby was still teaching when I was in school in the '60s. Yeah, she was a great teacher. And her sister Martha Anderson was a, was right. a senior English teacher. And uh, any other memories of that place and those people? No, it just uh, you know was a, a fun place to to be. It was a good school with good uh, academic and uh, athletic programs and. Was the PA it, there at that time? It, it, it was, and that's also a, a good memory. PA as in Prince Avenue right. Pharmacy, which was a, a good gathering point 
Did, you, uh, did uh, your folks tell you to stay away from the PA all the After also? school, no, no, they didn't. That was, the, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was open. That was the after school t place. Terry to Jordan, that was a good place to meet and was on through college days. That was. We've, we've heard about the PA. Still it must have been a nice, nice place. Talk to me then a little bit. You, you finished high school. Did you, did you finish through the 11th grade then? Or through yes, the it was, it was, it was, it was 11th, grade. 11th, 11th grade. So I was a, 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 a young high school graduate and came to the, came to the University of Georgia and in, enjoyed, enjoyed living at home. And I, I guess everybody who's ever here thinks they were there at the best time in history and that's the way it, uh, it, sh it should be. I know my granddaughter does now who is, who is here, but it was, it, was a, it was a fascinating time because you had uh, Others like me, who were graduates from high school, of 11 years at that time, and then you had uh, war veterans returning uh, to the campus. Many of them married, and many of them, you know, there were some in their late 20s or, or 30s who went to school at the same time. So it was an interesting uh, mixture of people and an opportunity to meet uh, different people and. Somebody asked me later if I felt uncomfortable with that age, but I don't uh, recall anything other than, uh, you know, kindness and friendship from Good. The, the older Good. students. So the student body would have been, Abbott, do you remember what size would it have been? It, it would have been, thousand? it would have been uh, probably 3,000 to 3,500 in that range uh, during that time. And they went to the co-ed too, didn't they? Those old fellows. That's right. That's right. That was a popular place with, with them, and it was, uh, and that was a good time to be in Athens because uh, the percentage of females on the student body was much higher than. I've heard some of the ladies say the opposite. Than, so. than, than, <laughs> than the males during that time, but, uh, and Fran, it was also, uh, you know, also worked some at the at the co-ed, uh, had an old-fashioned soda fountain, running the soda fountain and waiting tables and working the cash register sometimes. That okay. was kind of fun, though, though wasn't Kay it? says she sees no sign of any of that <laughs> training around <laughs> the house, but that was fun and a good time to see people. And uh, during the war, uh, as you probably know, the uh, Navy took over part of the campus including the, the three, uh, what had been co-ed dormitories mm -hmm. on Ag Hill, uh, Rutherford, Mary Linden, and uh, Sewell, I guess, maybe the third one, but anyway, and uh, the cadets were restricted to that side of Lumpkin Street. So many times and most days they would come to that gazebo there and a call from my brother Henry or me, and we would to take their order and deliver milkshakes or Sundays or... or, or, or Y'all would figure it out. food across the street, yeah. so. And did they drill out there in that quadrangle? They, Is that what they did. Those lucky folks from around the country got to come to the University of Georgia. They did, and I think they took over part of the uh, coordinate campus, which is now med med medical facilities now. It's great that that's back as, as UGA campus. I'll tell you what, it's amazing the growth, isn't it? We won't talk about that later. Abba just said you lived at home and then you've already talked about walking. Did everybody get get around walking? Mostly, much? but that was one of the great things about living at home. I know some people would turn up their nose when they say you lived at home and went to college, but I thought it was a, the best of both worlds because I could go to to campus, to dormitories and fraternities and sorority houses, and uh, I had uh, good home uh, cooking and uh, uh, yeah, long, long, la all. laundry service and and, ac <laughs> and access to an automobile. You were in good uh, shape mo most days, and there were were not many on campus at at that time. In fact, Herded Drive was a th through street at that time from from downtown near the Arch. On through towards fine arts. 
I went all the way to Baldwin Street. Uh, yeah, yes, all the way to Baldwin yeah. Street. And I can, uh, I can remember when I was running close for an eight o'clock class in what was then called the CJ Building, Commerce and Journalism, now Terry College. But uh, I can r remember rushing and parking right in front of the, of the business side and rushing in for my eight o'clock class and then rushing out quickly to get my car and move it away. But it's, uh, and, and now that's closed completely for. That was a blessing. For automobile traffic. To be able to park in front of your building, <laughs> Abbott, gosh. Talk a little bit, you were, you mentioned uh, the business side. You uh, were in the business school. Talk a little bit about your fa the faculty or the people who were I know not necessarily in the business school because you okay, have Okay, yeah, I was in business school and then I took a, a minor, I guess you would say, in uh, political science and public administration. So apart from the business school, I had an opportunity to, to hear and meet and learn from people like Dr. Albert Say, who's the author of a number of, of uh, books, Constitutional History of Georgia and, and others, and he also was it was advisor to Demosanian Literary Society that we may want to talk, talk about. But, and then there was some outstanding, I remember Hal Heckman was one of the outstanding accounting. Both of them were there for years. Professors, so they, they really were. Um, who probably had the greatest influence you, on you? Do you think it was there? So, were there some folks who? Well, uh, my parents, of course, who had a tremendous influence on me, and who were a good combination. My father, as it was the case with many people, uh, was able to go just through the sixth grade, but had uh, as, as much or more common sense as anyone I knew. And uh, my mother was a three-year graduate of uh, what was in Georgia Normal Industrial College at Milledgeville. But they were a great couple, and with their different backgrounds, they were determined that, that all six of us have a college of uh, a degree, and most of us were able to obtain a, a two degrees. So that was a great influence, that's, and in, that's quite a record. I think. And encouragement, and then uh, the Boy Scout program was important to me and others growing up. My three older brothers were eagles, so. There was no way I was going to stop. You, you had to do that stop, too. Stop short of that, and, and Fred, Fred Bennett, who was a professor in the dairy department, was our scoutmaster, and uh, was very helpful to us. And in fact, he would take some of us over, and we would work in the old creamery. Right? They're helping make ice cream and other things. I'm I sorry that creamery, the creamery doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. <laughs> a, a, a lot, a lot of people do. But I'm with you. I miss that creamery. We are blessed in Athens to have the good folks who are here on campus who are in our community and have made such a difference. It's just been, I think, town and gown-wise, we're just yeah, blessed it, in so many it ways. It really makes a difference. And we, we uh, family went to First Baptist Church and had a good, good influence from, from, from those there in the Sunday school and RA and other, oh. other activities there. So it was. Uh, I asked Pete McCommons the other day, uh, it, when you were growing up, did everybody you know go to church? Almost everybody. And I said, I agreed. You know, he said yes. And I, he grew up in Greensboro. And that's and I another. I said, yes, certainly here in Athens. Everybody I knew went to church. That was a thing, just, thing to do and still is, but un unfortunately it's, it's an interesting, not, it's, as, not as, as prevalent now. Right, absolutely. And then, Fran, it was fun being involved with uh, Extracurricular. I was going to say I have a statement to make about activities that. on. You were on truly campus. one of the people that realized that college education education didn't just take place in the classroom, and you jumped in with both feet. Abbott, your your amazing record. You let's talk about some of those things. You mentioned Demosthenian. You were president of the Demosthenian Literary yes, Society. Yes, and that was good. That's a, the oldest college debating society in in America, and that was a good opportunity to have some le leadership training and op opportunity to speak before others and to and to meet other other students and Fran my 
older siblings, three brothers and my sisters, were all extremely active when they were on campus. So that also was an influence on me and sort of, you had role models. Sort of, sort of paved the way. I had them as role models and then I had uh, some who knew them and knew about them who uh, quickly picked pick, pick me up and helped me when I came to, to campus. Some upperclassmen, uh, most of these aren't living now, but George Lawrence, who was later the uh, district attorney in the Eatonton Milledgeville area, and Aubrey Morris, the uh, voice for years on WSB, and Buddy Hargraves, later dean of the forestry school, and uh, Fluka Stewart, who was later involved with public relations activities and various things. But they were all uh, re re returning veterans who were active on campus, and uh, they quickly helped me get involved in a number of different activities. And of course, today and any other time at UGA, I think person can, any person who wants to, male or female, can find their niche on campus, but admittedly it was probably easier at the time I was here because the, the student body was, was smaller, and if you wanted to participate, there were, there were many ways to do it. Well, you're exactly right about good folks giving you a hand up and a, a leg up and, and helping you get involved, and that was my experience too. Abbott, talk, before we leave Demosthenian, talk about the rivalry between Demosthenian and Phi Kappa and, and how that may not have been quite as vigorous as it was but, uh, during the war yes. between the states, but and, certainly. And, and I like that name. You could use the right name for the war between the states, <laughs> a plan or, or a war of northern aggression, That's the right. war of southern independence, right. but not that other name. But anyway, that name you used, or we did not use when I was on campus, we referred to it as the society across the way. I see, but you we, didn't even speak their name. But, but we did not speak the, Is that we, where we did not speak the name and of course it was a, it was a friendly uh, rivalry and, and that continued for a number of years and I assume still does. I, 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 it just, my dad talked about it and he was there in the early 30s. Evidently it was a fairly vigorous competition back there, so. Did you all debate each other? Or? Oh, well, it did on occasion, but most of the times it was the, the debates within each society. But they would, uh, each one would often be referred to. I, <laughs> I know in Demosthenian, and I've heard from the society across the way as, uh, I see. as well. But in and, and, uh, Demosthenian, years ago, started having some all night sessions. And I know sometimes somebody at those will refer to that society you uh, mentioned. I know one year uh, somebody had a little thing he did referring to him saying that uh, lived in obscurity, died in shame, never quaffed a cup of fame. <laughs> and, and, and I'm sure there was similar dark thrown from the, <laughs> On the, the other side coming of that. Back your other way. Side of that Purdy campus, and, and when Elliot Hagen was in Congress years ago, he wrote a resolution about the other society, which passed in Messenian, and so, as of a few years ago, we're still hanging, <laughs> still hanging on the walls there. Oh, talk a little bit about campus politics, Abbott. Um, how, how did it work when you went to school? You know, over the years, it, it's up and down, and people are involved or not involved. How did, do you remember about student government? And, and I did do, you, I did do. Did you campaign? And it, you? it was a lot of fun. You did for, for class offices. Right. You, you were and president I, of the sophomore class, is that right? That, that's correct. That's great. And they were, the, the, the campus politics was fraternities and sororities on one side, and independence on the other side and for the independent men the the name was grand old party no relation to national party politics and the and the women were a party of organized women POW and they met separately like the the uh, independent GOP group met in the, in the chapel and usually had larger attendance so the independents would nominate candidates and uh, 
the fraternities and sororities would nominate candidates, so there would be basically two candidates for each each class office. Were and, there debates? And, and it, no, no, no debates, debate. but just you know, material circulated and contact made and so forth, and it was all friendly competition. You know, some of us had as many many friends or more on the fraternity and sorority side than we did on the independent side, so it was uh, all in fun and, and worked together on many things. But when my oldest brother Dyer, uh, who was later executive director of the Alumni Society, but when Dyer came to Georgia, he was talking about pledging a fraternity and wrote home as you did in those days for money and my father sent him a check and said here it is if you want to join but I have five more to send to school <laughs> so I'd rather you wouldn't and Dyer being the good fella that he was uh, tore up the check and and was very active on campus and so he sort of set the stage for the, for, for the rest of us to to, to follow that tradition. I think that's great. Now, I, I was going to say, um, as I've watched over the years the, the political business, it seems like to me that, that uh, then there was more, it made more sense the way things went than it does now in terms of how people divided themselves up. And it's a different world these days. But, but um, was there any real power in being an officer? Was it in name only, or did you just liaise it, with the it, administration? It, or? Uh, it, it was mostly name only in those days, and, and particularly in the lower classes, more involvement right. probably by the, by the senior officers. And the, the, the real so-called power would have been in the uh, presidents of the Infraternity Council and Panhellenic Council and the uh, campus leader who was elected you know, by the non-fraternity uh, uh, men and who had uh, a certain designated responsibility. In fact, it was the campus leader who sold the rat caps mm -hmm. when every freshman was required to, 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 to wear one. I don't know when that played out, but that uh, was in for a number of years. And then, of course, the, the officers of the uh, organizations, uh, the debating societies and the honorary societies and, and all were really more involved during my time here than, than, than were the class officers. That's interesting to, to know how that, how that worked. Uh, Fran, I was just looking over uh, today some Pandoras from, fr fr from my time and uh, reminiscing a little bit. It's interesting seeing some of the pictures in there when uh, when I was a freshman, uh, uh, a movie star Janet Blair came for homecoming and uh, I was asked by Bill Train who worked with Blue Key and, and was with the Alumni Society uh, if I would escort her during part of that way in the stadium. You said you thought you could work that yes, out. I, I, I could fit that in my <laughs> I could fit that in my schedule, and then they were reminded about the the, the big name bands in those days, uh, homecoming and commencement, and what they call little little, little commencement. Who and, did you see, Abbott? And Do you one, remember? One of those years, uh, Les Brown and, and the band of renown, as they called them, was here and. Uh, and, uh, and the singer with his band was, was Doris Day, who became much famous later, so they were, they were there. Those, the dances in those days were either in uh, Woodruff Hall or in the old Stegman uh, building that the Navy built, I think, here, yeah, that's, that's not there anymore about where the Tate Center is. But those, but those were, 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 were big events, and they were, at one of them, I guess at homecoming, maybe they were lead out by the officers of the non-fraternity groups and by the fraternity groups and their dates and just uh, and well, they, a and grand march sort grand of kind march, of thing, yeah. and, and there were even tea dances 
in the afternoon, I think on Saturday afternoon. They yeah, or a party what school. They call it. Yeah. <laughs> they, 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 I, don't, I don't think they rated party schools in those days. I hope we wouldn't have been at the top, Fran, but it was a good place to be. Oh, well, we've had some folks talk about what wonderful times those were. Um, not only were you involved at the Pandora, you were assistant news editor and circulation manager of the Red and Black. Albert, how did you have time to do all this stuff? Well, I enjoyed all those things. What Fran, and that was fun. And his uh, circulation, uh, working in the circulation department, I was able to deliver the red and black to the sorority houses up before I found ch my child bride, Kay Ann. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was good. And my, uh, as I say, all my siblings, Dyer, John, Henry, and Sarah before me were, were very active on campus. Uh, Dyer was uh, editor of the Red and Black, and then Sarah was editor, the, the first woman to be editor of the Red and Black, in fact, so, you know, in your I, blood. I just kind of followed yeah, being, in being involved. Blood. I just didn't arrive to that level in <laughs> Red and Black, but I enjoyed being involved on both the news and the circulation side. And it, that's another time change thing, Fran, that the office of the Red and Black was in the basement of the journalism side of the CJ building, and uh, you, you know, and was a student in a campus-run newspaper. I know that, so I guess it's a private publication. Independent with, operation with a, with up a the nice hill. Nice building nice. out there, but but uh, but I I know still using journalism students or something. But that was a good. It was good for students to be involved, and particularly good for for journalism students. Great learning learning place with when they were doing the real stuff. I'm just looking, Abbott. Alpha Phi Omega, is that the service group? Uh, yes, that's the Boy Scout, former Boy Scouts. Uh, we did service uh, projects various, various service projects, the March of Dimes and fundraising for various right. projects and sometimes assistance to, to, to scout groups. and. You president of Biff Ted, you were in ODK and X Club. Yeah, and those were good groups that you had to do Honorary. a certain amount of other extracurricular activities to, to qualify for. And Biff Ted is, uh, it was sort of the freshman sophomore honorary group, and I think it later became the Tate Society. Biff Ted as itself does not exist, but I still have a picture somewhere when I was initiated into gridiron when we wore a tuxedo and had to roll up the pants legs and carry a broom and uh, do various things. They made a picture in front of the... I didn't think, I don't think that's changed. Has the it? Arts, <laughs> I mean, it made, made me even more. Now, and the others were were good good groups. Uh, but Biff Ted, which later against that side, it was, of course, was just a UGA right. club, as was the Elks Club that was sort of the sophomore junior leadership group that, that phased out years ago. ODK, Oakland Delta Kappa, of course, is a, is a national group and is still uh, alive and well. And Blue Key is, I think, I think University of Georgia was the second campus to have Blue Key started at uh, the University of Florida. Talk about Blue Key because it has a, a relationship that I want to ask you if it impacted your life in such a way as to kind of where you ended up going. But Blue Key has more of a, of a political connection. You political probably. and still a service connection. It's interesting and it does a great job now. And uh, these awards did not exist when I was here as a student, but they now have uh, alumni and faculty awards and, and student awards that are presented a very, at a very good banquet every year. Honor some of those and, folks and, who've and, worked hard. Have a, a speaker to who usually is one of the, the honorees, so that's a is is a good is a good group. And when I was here, Fran, uh, there were no females in any of these organizations that we've talked about uh, so far. They are, of course, today. But you had more to board. But you had more to board, which was the women's organization. And a, as you may know, when a person is selected for mortar board, 
the mortar board members go to the room of that person during the middle of the night uh, to it, it, it's a surprise induction to tap them for mortar board membership. So my sister Sarah was uh, very active and was uh, uh, president of Warman Student Government, which they had in those days, and that's another interesting subject. By the way, it's high, it's high times to change on rules and those things, but anyway, in the, uh, she uh, was elected to mortar board and also lived at home. So they called mother to tell them not to tell Sarah or anybody, but that they would be coming to find out how to get to Sarah's room. And she told them just to drive up in the backyard there at Wilcox Street, and the back door would be open as it always was. In fact, in those days. That's a change, too. That's another change in time. <laughs> but uh, just come on in at whatever time they wanted to come and the steps are right there near the back door so go on upstairs and uh, Sarah's bedroom was the first bedroom on the left. So I was sleeping in a big sleeping porch type room with uh, two beds uh, in it and I was on the far side of the room as the only one in that room at the time. So I woke up in the middle of the night with the dean of women and a lot of beautiful co-eds in robes and candles gathered around my bed <laughs> sing, singing the mortarboard song. Oh, and so I, quite a hoot. so I sat up and said, oh, yeah. <laughs> hello, Miss Sellers. And, <laughs> and that was the fastest turn of a procession <laughs> Out they went. that I have ever seen in my life. So they made a quick uh, exit from my room and went to Sarah's went room. Went to the but, right room, huh? But she and others used to say for years after that that, that I was only male member <laughs> of, of mortar, board. mortar board. And then my stir was messed up because they later started inducting women. And, and uh, my son Lewis was a member of mortar board and some of these other groups. When right. the, Became co ed She sure was here, so that's another. Well, it's, uh, another, that's a great story. Another time, times change. A great story. And of course, in those days, uh, both during my high school and college days, you could uh, stand on the corner downtown where the YMCA was on that corner where the Holiday Inn is Lumpkin now. Lumpkin and Broad. Lumpkin and Broad. You could just stand on that corner and you didn't have to put up your thumb or anything. People knew you were looking for a ride to or close to five points. Stop and and they would stop up. and pick you up and you hop in and go out there and the same thing across from the Coed there. That was another pickup point. And again at Bloomfield and at Five Points. So when I didn't have a car, it was very easy to, 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 to catch a ride and uh, many students use that very well. And, and I know some people uh, from other places uh, who hitchhiked to and from Athens. It was a to, new, it to, was a different day. To, to school, it was a different yeah, time. It, it, it's a, a shame different. that those things can't be done that's anymore. The, that's the truth. Talk a little bit about um, campus traditions. You mentioned rat caps and the shirt. Let's talk about rat caps and the shirt tail parade a little bit. Maybe a little bit about homecoming. Okay. Well, the shirt tail parade was uh, interesting. Uh, Wonder how that started. And, 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 and you know, I'm, I would like to know. I'm not sure. Take you and, your pants off and run down. You and I need to you. find that. But you met down on what was the track then, as I recall. It's about where the again the Tate Center, the expansion of the Tate Center is. But you met there, took off your pants or your trousers, and with the upperclassmen uh, chasing you with a belt and cars blowing horns at you or something. You, you ran up ran up Lumpkin Street through town and out Prince Avenue to the coordinate campus where the freshmen and sophomore girls who were there in, in, in Miller Hall and Bradwell and others out there were, were, were waiting and the, waiting the group you. ran out there and the word, you know, was that you were in trouble if you didn't run the shirt tail parade. I don't know whether they ever tracked anybody down if they didn't run, but, but most, most freshmen you, you know, just thought it was a thing to do and, and, and did it. I don't know what year that phased out. But. That, that 
But that was something. I think it was well into the 50s. Then, of course, in the 70s, we had the streaking. So I guess that was an early... <laughs> an early that's de that's uh, a, mm. another change. And home... Uh, you're talking about homecoming, and of course the senior class is, is too large now to do this, but uh, when I was a senior, the senior class during the half marched to, uh, around inside the hedges in Sanford Stadium with the top hats and canes for the, for the males. And that was an interesting tradition that, that as, uh, as classes grew, had, had to had to phase out at some point. You mentioned uh, BIFTAD becoming the Tate Society. Talk a little bit about why BIFTAD became the Tate Society and, and, and okay. for in, whom that in, was named. In honor and in memory right, of, Dean, right. of Dean Bill Tate, who was an amazing fella, the Dean of, of Men for, for, for many years and one who knew everybody on campus and uh, and in many cases, the, the, the parents are b b before them. I know my entire I, family, generation after I, generation. I knew, I knew him and knew me and knew all of my, my siblings. And I would, I would see him when he would see a student and you know, say, how's your father, so-and-so, and call him by name. And I tell you, he, uh, he, has been, he has been a phenomenon and somebody that Everybody that was in school prior to the 1970s has mentioned. Okay, well, he was just a, a, a great person who was interested in the welfare of every student and wanted people to do things right and to keep up with their studies. And do, do you to, have any special Dean Tate to, stories? To, to be involved. Mm -hmm. uh, you stayed out of trouble. So I tried may, to stay out of trouble. You may not have seen him as much as some of these other folks. I can folks. stay out of trouble, but I can remember when I was in his office for some uh, student planning meeting when he just wrote out an excuse for everybody there who was missing class. Class, and uh, I was in law school at, <laughs> at the time, so I thought, well, since. I, since I've got it, I'll take it to, I think it was D. Mead Field, who was an evidence mm -hmm. professor. So when I passed his office the next day, I, he was behind his desk and I said, that, uh, the reason I missed yesterday is this meeting, I had an excuse from Dean Tate. And he just sailed it back across the desk and said, well, did he give you a copy of my lecture? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good story. <laughs> uh. Yesterday, but one, one student told me that he was having trouble getting a, a date ticket for his girlfriend who was in school somewhere else. And a friend of his said, well, what you ought to do is just apply for a spouse ticket. I did that, and that's easy to get, and you get it for all the, the home games. So he did that, and he said a few weeks later he got a message to come to Dean Tate's office and that he walked in and Dean greeted him, asked him how his classes were going and everything, and he said, uh, you know, how's your father doing? Tell him hello from me, and they talked on a while, and then he said, well, I appreciate you coming by, and he said he got almost to the door, and Dean Tate said, said Ralph, did you get married? And he said, no, sir, Dean Tate, and he said, well, please explain to me why you applied for a spouse ticket for football games. So he said he had him come by his office every Friday afternoon for an hour for a while. To <laughs> How did but he, he was keep right up on with it? He kept he, up with every facet and was, every person. It's he, just amazing. He was right on top of everything. Mm -hmm. And so it's appropriate that a, that a good, honest society like Biff Ted transitioned in to the Tate Society, and, and the Tate Society is becoming, has become even more active and is, is a good force. It is, and it's on, male and female on these campus days. campus, so. which, is, which is good. It's the way right. it ought to be. And by the way, one of my good memories, Fran, is uh, being on the committee to talk for the Alumni Association to talk about an additional verse for the alma mater which also was recommended by the, the faculty 
council, but uh, the Alumni Association Committee uh, recommend that. It was written, as I'm sure you know, by Gail Walker the end of the verse, but the committee recommended it. It was uh, approved by the Alumni Board and uh, I think was first used maybe the late 1980s. That sounds right. Or something, but again, it's interesting how times is, it's changed, uh, you know, and that was a way with many things, not only just UGA, but Absolutely. where women were not in the forefront, but uh, a verse that included but women. I, I love that verse, as you know, and my daughters proudly join me, take their rightful place. It's a great, it's a great addition. Uh, she did a nice job. So uh, it's, it's, it's good and it's, uh, it's great that those opportunities are, are available to all students now. It is, it, it is a new day even from the time, because I was in school in the mid to late 60s, and even at that time, uh, you had your men's groups and, and you had your women's groups, and then right. n not much in the twain did they meet, so. Uh, right. And Fran, we talked we talk just briefly about the rules, but if my memory is correct, when I was here, female students had to be in at 8.30 during the week. So things like music appreciation in the chapel on Wednesday night were popular because you could sign out for a little extra time if you're doing those things. And it's uh, uh, and and eleven o'clock, I think on the weekend. Weekend. And now when I ride through downtown Athens late in the evening, mm -hmm. things are just beginning to start <laughs> now. <laughs> So, well, uh, so for music appreciation, you appreciated the music and each other. That's right. That was a that was everybody can figure out a way to to work the system. I think. And Fran, they the uh, you know one of the meeting spots. Of course, we talked about the co-ed, which is special interest to me because of the family situation. But when I was in school, the pharmacy building was in what is now New College. And so looking across from the administration building, now the left side of that building was what was called the, 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 the co-op, which was the, the snack bar in the visiting place. And I don't know at what time that phased out or moved on, but that was a, a, a good meeting place for students. So social. Between classes or right. after classes. What did a Coca-Cola cost? And 1940s. Oh, you know, I don't even remember. A nickel? That not, would it cost that Not much? much, but not long before that time, when I was uh, younger in Athens, there was a, a a drink manufacturer in Athens called the Three Summer, 3-C-E-N-T-A, and their slogan was, it breaks a nickel instead of a dime, it sold for three cents, so Coke must have been under a dime and probably <laughs> still was. And, in, in, in those I hadn't days, heard about so. the three cents of Bud Wine that was Miss Ruby Anderson that you mentioned's brother, Claude, I understood. Oh, had, and I didn't realize that. Had a soft drink, and it was called, I think it was initially called Blood Wine. And I had, it was sort of and I had heard and then, of that, but I didn't. Now, and then moved to Bud Wine because the blood sort of was off putting, I think, to folks. But I, evidently at that time, everybody was going to have their own soft drink. So a lot more. A lot more different than the today. Abbott, you graduated in 1949. Did you work, did you, you didn't go straight to Emory. You went to the state law department. What was that? Well, I was, uh, I did my last year before graduation as my first year of, of, of law school. And, uh, and so I, gradu I graduated in 49, and Gene Cook, who was the Attorney General then, offered me a job as his executive secretary. So I went to Atlanta to in my first of several jobs at the Capitol to, to work there, and uh, then went to law school at Emory Finished it out. At, at, in the evening, and then later worked for Congressman James C. Davis. and. Uh, Continued with my, stretched it out over several years, and then did my last quarter uh, during the regular day 
class, but did get my law degree at Emory. But since you uh, mentioned Emory, I would tell you that years ago a friend of mine was in Athens for a meeting, and that was when they were transitioning from LLB to JD mm -hmm. degree. And he said if I had time, he wanted to go by the law school and apply for his JD degree. And I said, well, that's good, that's fine, and, and I haven't done mine, I'll go by and do the same thing. So we went by the law school, and uh, the guy working there is John, somebody, Corey, I think, who's a friend of my brother, John. So we, we uh, talked a while, and then I filled out the card and wrote my check to the Student Law Association for my JD degree, and then when we got back to Gainesville that night, and Kay and I were visiting, she asked me how the meeting went in Athens, and I said, we're fine, we had a good day, and I said, Bryce and I stopped by and applied for our JD degrees, and she said, well, I certainly hope you get yours, your law degrees from Emory. <laughs> 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 you know, so, but I, I love the University of Georgia so that I, I never gave it another thought. So I, I, I called back and said, you know what? I called back and told him to keep my check, but cancel my application. <laughs> and and Bryce said I never should have called. That they were just he was going to just send, send me my right JD on. degree. I'd have had it from Georgia and Emory both. Hmm. Did you? I, I sort of referenced this earlier. All that extracurricular involvement certainly impacted your life during college, but did that also influence you as to what direction you wanted to go to after you got out of, with your life after you got out of school in terms of? Uh, well, it, uh, it, it, it helped and I think it encouraged you, you know, to sort of try to use your full potential and do as right. much as you can and the, and the friendships from those activities uh, grew and, and developed and uh, when you mentioned Everything, Mr. Cook, but, did but, you, but your first job, did that he? Was, that was my, and life has been good to me because, uh, except for one exception, I've, I've never really applied for a job. I knew the Cook family because uh, his son and I were counselors at, at Camp Dixie and I had met them and he called and offered me that uh, job and I had some interesting experiences there. I worked as one of the attorneys for the highway to department and uh, worked in the bill drafting unit for the law department which was before they had the legislative council office good that background that the general assembly well. has now so that was that was good and then judge charlie world was on the court of appeals and he needed a law assistant and offered the job to Frank Ed Edwards, who he, he and I were the only two people in the bill drafting unit. Frank came back from talking to him and said, the judge offered me a job, but I don't want to leave. And he asked for a suggestion, and I gave him your name, and he said, please come up and talk to him. So I went up from the second to the third floor of the Capitol, and, uh, and he offered me that job. So I, I, I did that, and then uh, I was active in the, the JCs, the young men's organization in those days. Women are now eligible now. But a friend of mine in that group told me that Congressman Davis was looking for an executive secretary and wanted me to please come by and, and talk to him. So that, that led to that opportunity. Connections and relationships. And then, you know, you never know when you're out there, when you meet people, what's going to uh, uh, happen. Uh, uh, Governor Vandiver asked me to come to the Capitol as director of the State Commerce Department, which is now Department of Economic uh, Development, and uh, which, which I, I, I did in, was in, in smaller government days. Our officers were in the Capitol. And then I was uh, making a speech for the department to a civic club in Gainesville <coughs> and walked across this, the square to my car and crossed paths with W.L. 
Norton Jr., the attorney and, and later bankruptcy judge, and the one, by the way, who uh, initiated and organized the Richard B. Russell Foundation, and much of that material is now in the special library here, as you know. But anyway, W.L. told me that the Georgia Poultry Federation was looking for a staff person, and did I have any suggestion? He was the attorney for the Federation. So I gave him the name of four or five people I knew who were in all nonprofit organization work. And then we talked about a couple other things, and then I, we parted, and I took a few steps, and just uh, partially joking, I just hollered back and said, W.L., just put my name on the list. <laughs> and so the committee came to the Capitol the next week and uh, offered me the job, and Kay, Kay Ann and I were engaged at that time, and so it, I, I took the job and it's been a good one ever since. I've been there ever since and enjoyed it and then brought in later Mike Giles who I'm still working with him. He's the president now who had university credentials prior to that time and that time at the Capitol also was very special to me friend because through the state JC network among others I knew the, the uh, key folks in Columbus and the president of the Columbus JCs called me one day and asked me if I would ask the governor to sign a Miss Georgia Week proclamation, which of course he was happy to do. So two weeks later they showed up at my office in the Capitol with uh, K. N. Schaffner, who was a freshman at Agnes Scott, who was, who was the Miss Georgia. So I latched on to her. I was going to say. Short, shortly after that. I understood then, you toured her around the state. Is that right? And, and we, Tell that story. Well, that, when the, the time, uh, the, the next time I saw her after that meeting at the Capitol was at the annual Georgia Poultry Federation Bank, where she was asked, Miss Georgia, and I was invited because of the department. Thing, so I visited with her uh, there, and then immediately after that, uh, she and Miss Atlanta were at a convention in Buffalo, New York. Her mother was the chaperone, and I had flown to Buffalo f for that meeting, and some good friends from Milledgeville, uh, Johnny Grant, and uh, Floyd and Ralph Harrington and others had driven from Millersville to Buffalo. So I asked Kay Ann for a date and borrowed Johnny Grant's car. And Kay Ann and I had our first date driving from Buffalo, New York to Niagara Falls with her mother in the back seat, <laughs> continuing her chaperone oh, duties. So That's a and, great story. And then as soon as her time as Miss Georgia was over and she could marry, we married. And, moved to Gainesville and uh, she did her other three years at, uh, at Agnes Scott. So Lewis, Lewis was born between her junior and senior year and then she still graduated with honors and then Camille was born a couple of years later. So. That's great. I want you to talk about your children in just a little while too. You mentioned the Georgia Poultry Federation certainly and, and you've worked for those folks over 50 years, is that right? Yeah, but that's, that is a record. I remember, I was just a young boy when I started. Yeah, right, just a baby. How has that organization and your job description changed over the years, or has it? Well, it has. One of the things that was not mentioned at all at the time that I hired was uh, lobbying and government relations. Is that right? But I quickly realized that big role. That, that, that was, a, was a big role, and we m moved in. Uh, to that, and that's something that I've enjoyed and, and uh, have, have worked hard over the years, as Mike and I uh, still do now, and we've involved with uh, educational programs with the University of Georgia, and our Georgia Poultry Conference that was started in later years, that's, that's held in, in Athens every year. But just like a lot of things in life, uh, just, uh, you know, more complications, changes in time. Uh, more state and federal government regulations, so you need to be at the table mm 
in the paper every day. Talking, talking yeah. about those and helping members uh, address them and things like that. So w working to try to improve the competitive position of the Georgia poultry industry so that when the industry is expanding that hopefully we'll get more than our share within the state of Georgia. And we're proud of the fact that Georgia is the number one poultry state and poultry is the largest segment of agriculture and agribusiness. I was going to say the, the university and the Georgia Poultry Federation have been closely aligned over the years and supported each other and, and I wanted you to tell the story about helping to save the Four Towers building. Okay, and we have... We, will you tell that one? I sure will. We're very proud of that and I, and I should have brought some pictures to, uh, well, that, to show you. I'll have to share some with you, but uh, in the 1970s, we received a call one day saying that the university was about to demolish the old dairy barn because it, it was not it had not been used as a dairy barn for a while. They were about to demolish it, and Louis Boyd and some others told me later they saw the wrecking equipment there, ready to begin the the process. But we received the call from Extension Poultry saying if a poultry industry could raise $32,000, they would not demolish the building and it could be used for poultry offices and research. So we quickly put a committee together of 32, then it expanded or later, I think maybe to 38, but with the goal of raising the $32,000, and we're successful in raising uh, just over $36,000. So they held off on the wrecking ball and turned it over to Extension Poultry and that money was used and then the uh, faculty members and uh, students also spent time. And it was just a grass and weeds had grown up all around it and it was just horrible inside. So it was, it was transitioned uh, for with place for live chickens for poultry research and for, for, for labs and offices and conference room and so forth. And, and obviously, sorry, can, can I pick back up? Yes, sir. Obviously, since it was to be used for poultry, it did not need to be called the dairy barn. So somebody in this group came up with the suggestion Four Towers and that term was coined at that time and the Four Towers was, was, was used and uh, we had a number of important poultry meetings in there and some, some, some great research was done. And then later when more space became available to poultry in what had been the livestock poultry building and that full building was turned over to poultry uh, they moved from there, and as you know well, since your office was there, uh, Four Towers has been used well and is a is a beautiful building. It looked it it, it looked it was a step up when it became poultry, but it was a, a, a another step <laughs> when it was used for offices for for the UGA Welcome Center and for Agri the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences uh, yeah. and the Alumni yeah. as Association that I think moved in later after y'all did and had the, the Ag Hall of Fame and other things in that building. So, and, and there were plaques in the building of the committee members and, uh, and the donors who made it possible to- I appreciate to, those to, folks, to save that, personally. Save that building and it's, uh, I, I just think it's great that it's become such an important and key landmark on the University of Georgia campus. Well, my dad said and that it came that close to being I, lost well, that's right. if, if it hadn't been for the poultry opportunity and quick action. So That's the truth. My dad said he milked cows in that building back in the 36, 37, 38, right there. And it's, it's been there a long, a long, long time. time. But I was going to say, of course, those four towers, for the folks that don't know that building, are four silos. Silos, that's exactly right, right. Which, so, which a lot of people probably don't realize That's now. exactly right. Exactly but right. That's, uh, so, so that is exciting that it's so well... Oh, it's a, it's, it was a it was a great a great facility for welcoming folks to the campus. And then Fran, going back a little more, uh, my brother Henry was a poultry student at the University of Georgia, and uh, later was Extension Poultry. And, 
and, and, and had a small chicken house behind our house on Wilcox Street that somebody later turned into a small apartment. <laughs> <laughs> but the poultry department uh, at that time was in an old house on the site where the Georgia Center is now. And so my first introduction to poultry was uh, when I was in uh, junior high and in, in early high school when Henry would take me over to the poultry department I would work with him on candling eggs and, and do, doing various things in that. Uh, well, you've been in the in, poultry in, business in, all in, your in life. In that site, so. Right. so. I'll tell you, my experience was going to see that building as they had decided to make it the new visitor center and there were chickens still in there and I went home and told my husband those were the biggest chickens I'd ever seen and there was no need to worry about the poultry industry in the state of Georgia. They were enormous. Well, I love that story and, uh -oh. and, and the Lane Massey connection with that building through so many years. <laughs> oh. Well, I tell you, Abbott, you have truly uh, been active in lots of things beyond your paying job and certainly in your service to the university and your community in, in Georgia. You've been president of the Alumni Association, University of Georgia Alumni Association. You've been a University of Georgia Foundation trustee, member of the board of the UGA Research Foundation, chairman of the UGA Annual Fund, chairman of the Veterinary Advisory Board. It goes on and on. And in your other outside the university, president of the Georgia JCs, president of the Georgia Society of Association Executives, chairman of its board of directors, vice president of the Georgia Baptist Foundation, member of the FDR Warm Springs <laughs> Memorial Advisory Committee, president of the Gainesville City Board of Education, Gainesville Rotary Club, the list goes on and on. Thank goodness for dedicated and committed folks like you. Well, we are nice to mention all those things. We are blessed. I, I, well, that I, doesn't even cover all I, of I it. I enjoyed every one of them. And I, I, it's just, it's, but beyond your, certainly your dedication and commitment, you've got an exceptionally outstanding and dedicated family too, and you've already mentioned Kay Ann and, and her, her time as Miss Georgia. Talk about Lewis and Camille, your children, and tell okay, us, because I know they're you. outstanding. Thank young. you for asking, and I'm uh, proud of them and of their uh, children. And Lewis is a uh, 1984 graduate of the University of Georgia and uh, continues to be involved. And interestingly enough, uh, a few years after that, when there was a young alumni association, uh, he became president of the Young Alumni Association the year before I became president of the Alumni Association. So he led. He led we, you. He, he was ahead of me, yeah. and we had an opportunity to work together then, and had a couple of joint uh, meetings of those uh, boards, mm -hmm. which was which was 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 fun. And then uh, Lewis uh, did some things in financial planning. But he served, uh, he was Secretary of State of Georgia, in fact, was the youngest person uh, ever to serve in that uh, position. And uh, currently with three other folks, he has a public affairs uh, firm, uh, uh, Massey Bowers, Watson, and Henry. And uh, he's in enjoying that and has a, has a number of clients. And uh, his wife, uh, Amy, who he met after his University of Georgia days, is also an important uh, part of the family. She's a she's a, a, a triathlete and a speech therapist and oh and uh, 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 other things. And they have they have three uh, bright children. They're uh, the, the first one, Chandler. Chandler Abbott Massey, to be exact. Uh, he's a graduate of Norcross High School and was in the honors program at uh, UCLA. But after one quarter audition for it and obtained a, a part on Days of Our Lives on NBC, so he's doing his education part time and online now, but uh, won the Emmy Award last year. Just fabulous. For the outstanding young actor, so we're proud of him. And then uh, uh, Cameron, uh, their daughter, loves being at the University of Georgia. 
she's a she's a, a sophomore, uh, finishing her exams now. Is a is a prime U and is uh, just been selected as one of the ambassadors for of Spear School of Public and International Affairs for next year. And, She's looking forward to that. Sounds like she's going to be following in your footsteps. She is, and then, and then uh, Christian, who's very talented, is in Pinckneyville Middle School and uh, heading for Norcross High School next year. So uh, we'll we'll see if we can bring another get, one get, on. Get, get, yeah, get him here over some time. And uh, uh, Camille out talked us uh, after she heard about the Syracuse Communications school when new house school when she was in the governor's honors program and you know, she went to syracuse and then after graduation went to new york city she worked for the council on foreign relations and then went back to law school she said she thought she could be of more help to people with a law degree and she uh, went to uh, uh, the law school, uh, City University of New York, in their public interest law school program, and worked for the Lawyers Committee on Human Rights and some other things, and then the Council on Foreign Relations enticed her back as, uh, as vice president. So she's uh, working hard and doing well there. And uh, she uh, is single, but has an adopted daughter, Lucia, who she brought back from China, who's uh, 11 now. So. She's our, our fourth grandchild, and they're, they're, they're all very important to No, they are. To, to us. And that's just an outstanding, what an outstanding family, Abbott. Are there any favorite memories or stories about the university that you need to tell us that we need to have on tape that we haven't touched on, Abbott? What? Well, I just uh, loved it all, friend, and I loved... Uh, you know, uh, we talked the, the athletic events, uh, and uh, by the way, going back before I came to the University of Georgia, uh, when we first moved to Athens, uh, as you well know, there have been several expansions of the stadium, but on the railroad side of the track, uh, there was a small fence on the last separating the last section on that end from the rest of the stadium. And believe it or not, you could go around to the gate on that side and, and go in for 40 cents and see the Georgia games. That so, is another change. And, yeah. the, <laughs> and the bank was still a, a, a real change. And there was a bank there, of course, in those days next to the, next to the stadium. So some of us would enjoy going over there and. Uh, Playing, playing on the bank or going in the stands and watching the games, but then great then to, you know, really feel like I was a part of the University of Georgia. Early days. From the early days of Athens and then, and then go, going to those events. And it was, uh, you know, fun visiting around and meeting people from all over the campus. As, as you well know, now with the growing metropolitan area, there's a higher percentage of students from from the metropolitan Atlanta uh, uh, counties. Uh, when I was here, you you met people from small towns all over all over Georgia. Because most and, of the and, towns were small. And they were small, yeah. and I know some of those still come. But you just you 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 saw a great cross section. Of of, uh, of of Georgia, and it was fun to meet people. By the way, one side story here, you know, old college, uh, where my brother uh, John lived when he was on the, the dormitory there, and I spent one uh, night with him there before we moved from Greenville. And those at that time, the the room still had a smaller room connecting which was what we were told that to where the slaves stayed when the students brought them to campus in those days. And, and Old College was later used for, for offices, and then one time partially offices in dormitory, but is now fully offices. 
But anyway, my story, there's a plaque on the front of Old College that says uh, uh, Crawford W. Long and Alexander Stevenson that lived in this room during certain times. And that's a unique story that those roommates were the Georgia's two representatives in the Statuary Hall in Washington, D.C. But anyhow, when I was here, two friends were assigned that room. And they properly went to town and had a sign made with their names saying, I think it was Tom, Aaron, and Bill Herndon lived in this room also and hung it, <laughs> Put over, him underneath. Hung it over the sign. <laughs> <laughs> hung it over the sign uh. with those two prominent people. But anyhow, I enjoyed going visiting with folks in Old College and uh, Millage Hall and the locations around the co-op I mentioned, the snack shack was where the Holiday Express is, sort of. Great icebox, lemon pie. At the bottom, and that was a, a, a good place, and a good place to go after, after events. The varsity was downtown on the corner, just across from the arch. And if my memory's correct, there's no, no written rule, but I don't think women went in the varsity. In those days, and for a long time, you'd sometimes see a woman outside, and a man would go in and get something, and exactly right. and, and and get it. And of course, been it, been some changes. Been a lot of changes, and it's fascinating to come back and see all the new buildings that have been built over the years. In fact, so many in just recent years. Just so ride the, down the, the street the, and the, see a building the there. The real estate yeah, foundation and others, and just and, and more con construction. It's, it is amazing, and the yeah. changes and the growth, and I don't know, Abbott, this new special collections library is fabulous, and you that would be a place you would love to go because you can find things. It's that, amazing, and that's another an, another great addition. That's right. And another time change story, Fran, is, of course, like when I was here, there were classes in the academic building in, in some offices there but classes and I assume they haven't been there in in, 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 in many many years. I was going to say I know it's not since 1965 at least and I was going to say I was going to say but I've been connected with the university since 1965. I'm an Athens girl but I started the university in 1965 and I can say that in that time whenever I've heard people speak of those who've been truly dedicated to their alma mater, your name has been the one that consistently comes up early and often. And I think we have been blessed. You're a true friend of the University of Georgia and have been for nearly seven decades. Well, Is that you're, right? You're too kind, but it's brightened my life. But you didn't talk about any scandal. I think we did real well. <laughs>